Well, praise the Lord. Welcome to the seventh episode of the Scarlet Thread podcast. May look a little different today as we're in the studio of uh, my dad's church, Pastor Curtis Hutchinson, and uh, we we drove this weekend to uh, have our seventh episode special edition, you could say, with our first special guest. And I'll be preaching tomorrow morning at church at 10 a.m. And uh, we're we're excited for this weekend. We tried to come last weekend, but uh, sickness. Got a hold of me. I was feeling a little under the weather, so we postponed until this weekend. Last weekend was great. Um, I, I was there watching from behind the camera, and as these two dug into the Word of God and talked about the joy of our salvation. And uh, if you didn't watch that one, you need to go back and watch it. We had a little technical issue there uh, that we couldn't figure out with the view count and some of the other stuff there, but. Uh, the Lord's working all that out, I believe. So this week we're excited to be here in Queen City, Texas. Um, I'm, this is where I came from. This is where I grew up under my dad's teaching here. And for all of you who don't know, uh, he has a church here in Queen City, Texas, Crossway Church. And sometimes we, I like to joke and say it's Crossway City here. Because when the truth is being poured out, God begins to move on the whole city, not just one church. Especially when the people are on fire and they're taking it out and sharing it as well. So thank you for joining us here today. Good to be here. Glad you let me be on the broadcast today. I'm excited about it. I know it's going to be good. I'm glad the Lord's stirring your hearts to to get out there with broadcasts such as this and and help the church and help the world and help whoever has a heart to, to, to look for the Lord and want to serve the Lord and want to live uh, for Him. And, and so I think it's an exciting and an honorable thing that the Lord's called you all to be doing. And, and I'm just glad to be a part of it today. Praise the Lord, yes. And, and we are, we're excited once again to be able to do this on a weekly basis uh, and to bring the truth to you. We felt uh, led of the Lord to do this several months ago, and as we started, we just know it's been of the Lord. And, uh, you know, that's what that's what uh, the world and the church needs. The world and the church, they don't need what most people call a move of God, emotionalism. They need the teaching of the truth of the Word of God. We'll see today what delivers people. We'll see what saves people. As Paul talked about in our text today, that form of doctrine. It wasn't that style of music, that style of preaching, that style of this or that. It was the preaching of the gospel, the preaching of the cross, because that's the power of God. Amen. Unto those who are, be, are, are saved, and it's foolishness to the world, as the Bible tells us. When the world looks at what we're doing, and even when some of the church looks at what they're what we're doing, they're going to be saying, "Why in the world are you still talking about what got us into salvation? Why in the world are you stuck there talking about what Christ did at Calvary?" And that's because a lot of the church does not know that our participation in the death of Christ is an ongoing thing. We don't die daily. We reckon daily that we have died with Christ. Mm -hmm. It's a daily momentary by momentary thing that really we are putting to death daily those things that come against us and our new man and our new creation in God. We, we put those to death but we died once with Christ when we accepted him and each day we're learning Really, we should be learning in our Bibles, and that's our desire to teach each day what that really means. And, and we're learning each day what that death with Christ really does. So it's a good, that word you mentioned, participation in the cross. Uh, recently I was studying, and a, and a man was saying that uh, we're not really here to be imitators of Christ, and we get so disappointed when we keep trying like an actor in a play and we keep not being able to say our lines over and over. We keep trying to imitate Christ and that's not what we're called to do. We're called to participate with Christ, to be a part of the very life he's given us. We're called to be partakers mm -hmm. and, and participators in that which he offers us through his death on Calvary's cross and we get so frustrated when we uh, and a lot of times throw in the towel when we just can't imitate him. 
we'll never be able to imitate him. Right. And he's perfect, and we won't be like him until he's there. There's some times we do good, and there's many more times we don't do good. But we're called to simply partake of him. And I think where you guys are going to be in the scriptures today is, is going to help uh, a lot of people see that. And this, this great treasure of Romans chapter 6 is wonderful. Right. And let's go ahead and turn your Bibles there, if you haven't already. Romans chapter 6, starting with verse 16 there. Our topic today is, how do I live for God? And that can be asked in a, in a multitude of ways. How do I serve God? How do I live for God? Now that I'm born again, now that I'm saved, how do I live each day? I like to say it like this. How do I live a pleasing life unto God? How do I please the one who gave it all for me? And in that statement right there is the answer. And we'll see that today starting in verse 16. And if we don't have anything else to say, we can go ahead and hop right in. Praise the Lord. Verse 16. Paul's writing here in Romans chapter 6, the chapter that really unlocks the, the secret of the new covenant, how to live for God by faith. Verse 16, Paul says, Know you not, don't you know, that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. As a born-again believer, you can serve two things. And a lot of people may ask the question, well, what do you mean? I'm saved. Don't I serve God? Well, God has a way to serve him. He has a way to live for him by faith. The Bible says it's faith that works by love. That's, what get, that's how we operate with God, as we talked about on all the podcasts so far. The way that we interact and operate in our relationship with God, anything to do with God is by faith. It's by believing. We can't put it all together and figure it out and set it on a table and, and, and have control over it. If that was it, there would be no need for faith. But Paul says simply here, he's showing us that if we there's two options for the believer. There's no middle territory. You're either doing one of two things. You're either continuing in sin, which leads to death and separation from God, or you're continuing and being obedient in grace, which leads to righteousness. There's two areas. There's not a, well, you know, I, I'm not doing that, but I, I'm not being obedient, but that, that doesn't necessarily mean I'm serving sin. No, God has his ways. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of times I've heard people say, well, that's just cruel. And aren't you putting God in a box by saying that he only has this one way and he only his Holy Spirit only works by this way? one way. Well, no, I think we limit God when we teach that he can work in multiple ways Absolutely. because then he doesn't work. It's not that God doesn't do multiple things and carry out multiple jobs in our life. He does that, but he only does it by one avenue, and that one avenue is serving and being obedient, and that obedience is obedience to that which we have heard. As we will see as we keep going down the, the scriptures here, verse 17. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. That form of doctrine, it, it, it's a, it was a doctrine, it was a, a message, the message that delivers from sin. That's what the Bible tells me right here. It says, God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. And, and, and whatever this, this message Paul's talking about that these people believed into the heart, it was a message that the message that delivered them from sin. That's the preaching of the cross. As we look in Romans chapter 6, we learn that in verses 1 through 4, and you can read it on your own. I'm sure you've studied this chapter, but if you have never heard this before, verses 1 through 4, paraphrase, says that we have been baptized. When as soon as you accept Christ in your heart upon salvation, justification by faith, being born again, we talked about it a few weeks ago. As soon as you accept him, you're baptized in, in the Spirit. This is what happens. You're baptized into the death of Christ. 
you're buried with him by that baptism. We're not talking about water. We're talking about the operation of what the Holy Spirit literally did in your life. Mm -hmm. He baptized you into the death of Christ. You were crucified with Christ. You were buried with Christ. And you were raised in verse 4 of chapter 6 in newness of life. Mm -hmm. And that right there is the form of doctrine that Paul is talking about here. He's talking about the form of doctrine. He's talking about the message that you've been crucified with Christ. Paul, let me say this, didn't just preach a message of substitutionary sacrifice. He didn't just preach that Christ died for your sins. He didn't just stop there. What Paul preached was what Jesus Christ revealed to him, and it was this. He didn't just die for you. You died with him. You died and were crucified with Christ. And you may be asking, well, what does that mean? I wasn't there 2,000 years ago. No, but Christ was the representative man. If you read in, at the end of Romans chapter 5, it talks about how Adam, the first man, the head of all the human race, sinned. And because of that, sin entered the world in every person that was born. But Christ came and lived a perfect spotless life and died once for all sin and when you believe upon him you're crucified with him and it doesn't stop there now that you're born again how do you live for him how do you live a victorious pleasing life well it's by obeying that same form of doctrine continually right. the message of the cross Christ crucified and all that that entails, that everything has been provided in the death of Christ, not just, sanctif not just salvation and not just victory over sin, but everything in the entire word of God has been provided in that gateway in what Christ did at Calvary. Right. That, that is the gateway. That is where we have been baptized, immersed into, and as Paul very plainly said, we have been delivered from sin, and now we have the capability to be a servant of righteousness because we've believed a certain message. And it's not the style. It's not the, the, the phrases used. It's what actually happened. Christ, the Redeemer, the Lamb slain, the Lamb slain before the foundation, when He died, we died with Him. If we believe that continually, we will be serving righteousness. Mm -hmm. True. Uh, we, you know, um, and just to clarify, when we say to live for God, it's not just living as a Christian and being saved for God. You know, it's... Right. It's to, to clarify, to live for God is to live, as you said before, pleasing to Him. And um, as we all know, that can only be done through proper obedience. Um, something I want to point out, though, um, you know, it says in verse 16, To, to whom you present yourselves, slaves to, to obey, you are the one slaves whom you obey. And in verse 17, it says we obey from the heart. So from the heart, we either have a choice to obey one thing or another. And these two things that we mentioned are we're either going to obey sin or it says obedience leading to righteousness. If we go to verse 18, it's really, um, really righteousness. It's not, we're not just, we're serving, we're either going to serve sin or we're going to serve righteousness, mm -hmm. right? So, um, and the terminology they use is, the Bible uses is we're either slaves of sin or as verse, it says in verse 18, we're slaves of righteousness. We're either one or the, the other. From the heart, we have a choice to um, serve sin or we have a, from a heart the ability to serve righteousness and um, but, but as far as righteousness is concerned uh, talking about obedience still though it says that if we go to chapter 5 of Romans chapter uh, verse 18 it says um, therefore as through one man's offense judgment came to all men resulting in condemnation even so through one man referring to Christ through one man's righteous act the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. So because of Christ's righteous act, he became, right, 1 Corinthians chapter 30, he became righteousness. Because of this righteous act of going to Calvary, he becomes righteousness. And now when we hear this doctrine that we just referred to, that's when we believe from the heart, when we 
Christ did the work. He was did the righteous work, became righteousness, and that's the righteousness we're believing unto. And it's only, as Romans says, it's only revealed in the gospel. The righteousness of God is only revealed in what he's done on Calvary. When we hear we could receive that and become slaves of righteousness. But the other option still remains of being slaves of sin. And that's going to result to death. Um, just because we're saved, we still have to live. Uh, just because we're saved, we're... We're, we're alive, but we're not just here just to go about our life as a living being and just sit, slap God on top of it or say I'm living for God just because I'm saved and I just so happen to be living my life. No, that's not what we're talking about. You have to make, you have to, as my beginning of chapter 6 says, we have to reckon ourselves indeed dead unto sin. Mm -hmm. And but then when we reckon ourselves in dead indeed unto sin, when we consider ourselves dead indeed unto sin and alive unto God, then we present ourselves alive unto God. You know, we reckon ourselves that we truly are dead and Christ can now live in us. And then that's how we present ourselves unto our members unto righteousness. Right. And um, and that's a, a reality that we're supposed to be walking in. Paul encourages us not just to be saved and live life, you know, and, and uh, but to live unto God, to be servants of righteousness. Mm -hmm. And and it, it's it's a reality we see here that we're supposed to do from the heart, obey this type of doctrine that's going to um, lead us unto righteousness. You know, we're slaves of righteousness to be led into righteousness, to really be righteous. And that's what living for God is. It's, it's continuing continuing to be righteous uh, through what he's done for us on Calvary. That's the only way we can do it. Is we believe from the heart this type of righteousness, this act of righteousness that God did on Calvary. That way we can be conformed unto that righteousness. Mm -hmm. And um, It's good stuff, uh, one point you always need to remember when you're studying Romans 6 is every time but one time out of all the times the word sin is used, it's referring to, it's a noun. It's referring to the sin nature, mm -hmm. not acts of sin. It's only used once, maybe twice, once I think in the entire chapter talking about an act of sin. So in verse 16 when he says, uh, don't you know to whom you yield your servants to obey, his servants you are, whom you obey, it, it's all based on obedience. Everybody on the planet's obeying some, one of these two avenues, whether of the sin nature that's unto death, and that means for a Christian, our faith is in something other than Calvary and what Jesus did there, and we're trusting in something else. And now we're still saved, but our fellowship is stepped into a place where the Holy Spirit calls it death. Paul said it wrote about it in Romans chapter 7. Uh, I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, the sin nature revived and I died. I mean, he didn't physically die and he didn't spiritually lose his salvation, but he stepped into a place that the Holy Spirit considers dead because it's non-fruit bearing. Anything non-fruit bearing is dead. Faith without works being bare is dead. And so, uh, whether it's of sin nature that we're serving unto death, and, and everybody is in that boat who doesn't have their faith in the cross. And just because we did, you said something about just because we got saved, we can't just live how we want to and stamp God on it. This is the only avenue. Romans chapter 6 is a treasure chest, and it lets us know that at, at every moment, we're either serving the sin nature, which is the old man, because we're not trusting in what Christ did to bring about the new man so that we could, who was, we talked about it earlier today in Ephesians 4, was created in righteousness and true holiness. It's either that, uh, you know, serving the sin nature unto death, and let me say, whether you don't know anything about it or you've heard it and you reject it, the result is still the same. Right. Death, destruction, right. corruption, confusion, a place of being miserable. Most Christians are miserable. They don't know why. It's because they don't know this. And the ones that have heard it and still turned away from it, well, they can't lose that, that state of miserableness, if that's a word they're in. But the other one is of obedience unto righteousness. And that always speaks of Christ's obedience. Not our being obedient. Our obedience is all wrapped up in his obedience unto death. 
And that's really the only thing that's unto righteousness. Right. It's what he did. So yeah. <clears throat> you mentioned the obedience of Christ. Uh, I'm going to read a verse of scripture to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. Always come back to this because it's powerful. Here it's talking about spiritual warfare. And uh, I'll just read starting with verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. What is the obedience of Christ? Well, Philippians 2.8 says he was obedient unto death. We don't take uh, some thoughts, and, and we don't take just certain thoughts, but the Bible tells us this is really just, a, Paul is telling us here just how serious all of this is. Take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So to obey, right, to, to obey this this the the preaching of the cross that form of doctrine to serve righteousness means that you're taking every thought oh, uh, captive to the obedience of Christ it means that every thought and e every moment every passing uh, moment is being ser you're serving God you're serving righteousness by faith in what Christ did at Calvary that's his obedience. Taking every thought there to Christ's obedience means taking every thought to the place of the cross. And, and you might be saying, well, I do serve God. You know, I, I, I serve at my local church, and, and I feed the poor, and I help at all the fundraisers, and I might, I might even share the, the scriptures every once in a while, and I have a prayer meeting, and all of those things are great, but... As, as he said, what about your inner man? Is your inner man separated from God and not completely out of salvation, but serving sin brings separation from God. Serving sin brings death, which means separation. So if we're not serving righteousness, that doesn't mean that we're just We'll get a free pass, and, and we're not exactly serving sin, but we're not exactly serving righteousness either. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches you're serving one or the other, right. and what determines right. what you serve is what you're yielding yourself to. Mm -hmm. And if you're yielding yourself to the obedience of Christ, if you're yielding yourself to a place of constant trust and dependence on Christ's work at Calvary, then you will be serving righteousness. Mm -hmm. there, there, there's not a question about that. It's a guaranteed spiritual law. You know, he, Jesus was our example, and Peter wrote in 1 Peter 1.23, I believe it is, that, and I'm just paraphrasing, but the Bible says when he was reviled, he reviled not. When he suffered, he threatened not. But it tells us there what he did do. He, he committed himself to the one who judges righteously. Mm. He, he, everything Jesus did was righteous. Remember when he went to John the Baptist and said, baptize me, and John said, whoa, wait a minute. You, you know, you need to be baptizing me. And what did Jesus say? Don't let us do this for the sake of fulfilling all righteousness. Everything Jesus did was righteousness, but the door wasn't open for us to be made obedient unto righteousness except in his death. It's, 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 it's that, the only object we can believe in to be made righteous, to bear forth the fruits of his righteousness, and to be the servants of righteousness. That's the only object of faith offered. And, and, and Jesus, as our example of all things, committed himself to the one who judges righteous judgment, which means instead, instead of Jesus thrashing back when he was thrashed upon, he endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. Why? For this, Romans 5 teaches, this free gift of righteousness to be given to us. We are made righteous. We're clothed in righteousness. We're set on a righteous path. Our fruit is righteous. And all these things are in experience for those who choose 
to serve, really to obey. Not serving is obeying. Right. It's it, in experience we have the promises of God through obeying obedience that's under righteousness. And simply again, as you read at, at Corinthians, it's it's the obedience of Christ. I'm not obedient even because I go do something the Bible says to do. God doesn't even see that as obedience if my faith is not in where the obedience was offered to me. Mm -hmm. And then I'm serving, I'm serving righteousness. I'm serving God really only by serving obedience that's unto righteousness. If my, my, if my obedience is right in God's eyes, it's unto the righteousness that was offered me through the death of Jesus. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, w w someone might ask the question, what about those that don't know this truth, that love God, they're saved, they want to serve God, but they haven't figured out, they haven't, they haven't heard this truth yet. Very simply put, and in love put, you can still only serve righteousness or sin. And while we may love God, if we don't know how to serve God, it, we, you know, and that doesn't mean we're not, we're not loving toward individuals that don't understand it. What it, what it means is the Bible has, ha, it, it clearly lays out the way, and whether it be of ignorance or whether it be of rejection, it, if you don't, if the truth makes you free, yeah, listen to this, the truth is what makes you free, but if you don't know the truth, it can't make you free. If you, you can't be made free by a truth that you don't know and you don't believe. Right. And Je Jesus said uh, in John 17, 3, this is eternal life, that they know the one true God and his son that he sent. It, right. If you don't know Jesus, you, you can't go to heaven. Right. Uh, if you don't accept him as Lord and Savior through faith in what he did at Calvary, you can't be saved. God has never went around his plan of redemption to save one human being. Right. None. Not one. He he won't go around this way of sanctification to uh, allow even his own people to experience sanctification. That's why there's so many warnings in the New Testament, basically, that, that people who aren't focused on the cross and the straight way of the cross don't really ever see, or they don't think it's for them. Right. But uh, yeah, and and. You know, if, if, I, if I was in ignorance of this truth and you knew I was in ignorance of how to live for God by faith and you knew I was being dominated by sin and, and, and I love God and wanted Him to serve, wanted to serve Him and you just said, well, I'll, I'll let Him come to it in time and, you know, He's okay. I, I think He's okay. I really, He don't, He still loves God so it's okay. He doesn't really have to know this truth to serve God, well, I'm glad that that never happened to me because I would have never learned the truth. You know, we, we don't leave people uh, unknowing of this truth and or, or even rejecting of this truth. We're going to we constantly preach this, and, and people might say, well, you're still talking about how to live for God. You're still teaching people how to serve God. Don't you think they know by now? Well, look at the state of the church. Don't none of us know it good enough. None, and none of us know it good enough. None of us has arrived. Us understanding the new covenant and the message of the cross does not put us on higher ground, and it, and it doesn't make. And, and, and really, I, I think this is the best way to say it. We will never truly get it all down. So we never truly need, we never need to stop looking into it and studying out like pure and precious wisdom and gold. We, we were talking earlier and I said, we haven't even begun to scratch the surface of all of, that could be understood in the Bible through the lens of what Jesus Christ did at Calvary. So why would we stop here? Why, why would we stop teaching it here and stop believing it? Because as we've said today, there's two, there's two way, there, there's one way to serve him and there's two, two different paths and just because you're saved and you love the Lord, you are on the path. You are on the path. You're on the righteous path of God. You're born again. You're in Christ. 
But if you don't know how to walk in him, you are not getting closer to him. Right. And, and, and anyone, anyone that, you know, disagrees with that, it's only because any, re any reason that I could find that I would be offended at that statement would be because of something that I experienced before I understood how to please God by faith in the cross. Anything, any type of experience or, or emotion or tradition, that is what hinders one from saying it's this way and it's no other way. It's not because I'm saying it's this way. It's because the Bible is saying it's this way. We've got to be willing to let go of everything in order to please God. Those are who he reveals his covenant to. Paul was wanting desperately to please God. He was trying to delight in the law. He was trying to fulfill. The, he was trying to gain righteousness by the law, and God, he so desperately wanted wanted to serve God, and God revealed to him His covenant. And Paul didn't say, "Well, I think I, I don't know if that's it, Lord." No, because he was a heart who wanted to please God. He said, "That's it. That's the avenue of righteousness." That's how I serve you in righteousness, and that's how I quit serving sin. In a statement by Brother Swagger that we all know and is very powerful, the answer for which you seek is found in the cross. But I, I'll pose this to you. What if you're not seeking the answer? Then the answer won't matter to you. And it won't come. And it won't come. As Paul has said, it's something that we often skip over there. We believed from the heart that form of doctrine not we believed it mentally not I relied upon the faith of my, of, uh, uh, of my wife or not because I relied on the faith of my husband or my father or my friend but because I believed it from the heart because I wanted to serve righteousness and God showed me the way and if we truly want to serve him and I'll say this if we truly want others to serve him. This is the way. This is what to preach. This is what to share. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think something that hinders Christians from uh, learning to live for God, properly living for God, is having a wrong idea of maturity. And I think in a weird way, um, a lot of Christians think that maturity is leaving salvation, leaving justification, and moving on to this new thing, you know? And, and I think that's, and that's how it is for a lot of things in, in, in life. So it only makes sense that we think that this is true for Christian living, but that's not really true. Sanctification is only possible when we understand what happened at justification. Uh, when we understand what Christ actually did for us on Calvary, that's the only way we can actually learn to live for him. And, um, and, it, and the, the, it's, it's very evident in the life of certain Christians when you know, they have a genuine heart for God, and you know, we're talking about the sin nature. They don't want the sin nature to be ruling and dominating in their lives. But because they don't know what happened at justification, that at the cross, Christ defeated sin. He, uh, that sin was defeated. It's, it's gone. It's done away with. And as we live this life now, it's not that we're believing God for a new victory. We're believing God, God, give me victory over this. It's recognizing, no, Christ at the cross defeated sin. I'm in Christ, and now I'm dead to, I'm dead to sin. And it's not that the physical aspect in that moment goes away, but because you recognize yourself as dead to sin— that faith will soon fruition into a physical victory. And, um, and that happened at justification. And, and when we don't understand what happened in this moment at the cross, then we can't really learn to properly live for him. Right. That's a good statement <clears throat> that I heard some months ago was a man made the statement, and I've been quoting it quite a bit, that at the cross, Jesus himself became, he himself became the ending of everything that he once began. And at the same time, in that same death, he, be, he himself became the new and eternal beginning that will never end. And although all that's not fully seen right now, we know it's, it, it's true. Everybody that is in the, the first part of that, that everything he ended there that never makes it into the, the, the new and eternal beginning, well, they'll be thrown out. They'll be, they'll be done away with everything. The, the, this earth, the heavens, the, the people, and everything who never made it into him and who he is as the new beginning. 
everything happened on Calvary's cross as far as God is concerned. It, Jesus was crucified before the foundation of the world, but he still had to come and die. Ephesians 1 and 4 tells us that we were chosen in him before the foundation of the world, but we still had to be here, born of flesh and blood, and, 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 and be a sinner, and then hear the gospel and believe it. But everything has already happened in the eyes and the plan, the, 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 the vision of God, but it still has to be carried out. And so, and, and everything that ever did happen or will ever happen is based on what happened on that hill on that day by that man and his dying. Everything is based on that day because, because that's where all God's judgments, all his words flow from, is from the cross. Hmm. Only from the cross. It's the only place in, in Romans 5 talks about the gift and the free gift. Well, the gift and the free gift mentioned in Romans 5 is righteousness. That's the gift. Your grace, it's a gift, but really grace is what gets us the gift. Jesus tasted death by the grace of God so we could be declared righteous. We could have the free gift. Not only do we have the free gift of righteousness, he's mean, he means that we become righteous. And <clears throat> so yeah, it's uh, to be in a place of ignorance and not know what's taught here. It, it doesn't matter again if you don't know it, or you, as Brother Larson taught so well so many years ago, willful ignorance. Inside the word ignorance is the word ignore. You can be ignorant. Well, I've never heard that, and or you can hear it and then ignore it. Either one brings a place of being miserable and defeat, right. and what a sad thing it is to be already a born again, victorious, overcoming, more than a conqueror, but not experiencing those things. And without knowing what Romans 6 teaches, you'll declare who you are all your life, but you know with an honest heart, it ain't working for you, honey, because you're declaring it. You've got to learn what it means to serve obedience under righteousness. If you don't, then you're not going to be. Right. And to the degree that we value what he just described as God fulfilling everything and doing everything he will ever do through the sacrifice of his son, that's what that means. The, the, the phrase all-sufficient means that everything we will ever need was paid for and will be carried out by the Holy Spirit. And to the degree that we value that, what Christ did at Calvary, it will be the degree that we obey God and that we serve him in righteousness. Mm. Let, I, I, let's look at it this way. When you get hired at a brand new job, if we're just being real and practical, when you get hired at a brand new job and and uh, you know you're you're doing your job well. I'd hope that everybody does their job well to the end of its course. But and you're doing your job well, and over time you you might start to get a little lazy, and and you might start to uh, uh, slack off a bit. But to 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 the degree that you value that boss, that person that you're working for, is really the degree that you'll put that effort in, that work ethic. And it's the same with Christianity, but it's not by means of works. But to the degree that you value the Lord, and that doesn't just mean, uh, I want to give thanks today, God, for everything you've blessed me with. We should be thankful and we should be given thanks. But valuing God is, is fearing Him. And, and I'm not talking about a reign of terror. You're scared to death that God's going to smite you if, you if you mess up and all this. I'm talking about a fear of God. Fear means value. It means reverence. I'm talking about valuing what Christ has done at Calvary because when we value that to the degree that we should, our, li our whole lives will be yielded to it. And none of us will ever truly value it like we should perfectly. Yeah. But we were thankful for, for our salvation. But how much more thankful and how much greater value have you placed on what happened there since you learned Romans chapter 6? Right. You were thankful that God sent his son to save you. 
and, 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 and now you're forgiven. But how much more grateful and how much more valuable is Christ and his work on the cross now to you that you've actually seen with the eyes of your new inner man the truth of the scriptures that it was far more than a substitutionary act. By the way, it was that. But it was also not just you being forgiven, but you being inexperienced, delivered by this same power every day from yourself. Right. The more you learn the scriptures in the light of what we see in Romans 6 about the cross and what really happened there and what it really produced there, the more thankful you're going to be, the more value every day. I believe Jesus knew that when he taught that to follow him, you'd have to deny yourself, take up your cross every day to be able to follow him because I believe only through that avenue, not only do you, you, you can't follow him outside of faith in the cross, but you can't grow in a, in a greater appreciation and a greater value and a greater thankful heart, just, just, just becoming more thankful all the time without having your faith in the cross and learning how to live for God. You, and if you don't know, then you need to be crying out. And I promise you, he's going to take you right here to this chapter to start teaching you. Right. And and this is, you know, someone may ask, well, what, you know, you, how do I live for God? How do I do all the things that this Bible tells me to do? How do I understand what he's telling me to do in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? How do I understand what Christ has commanded us to do in the new covenant? The fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians, the Beatitudes. How, how do I, how do I be, how, how, how can I be meek? How can I be long-suffering in all these things? Well, as we were talking about earlier, we are being conformed into the image of Christ. And the Bible also says we're being conformed into his death. We are being conformed into the very person of Christ and everything about him. I'm not going to wake up tomorrow and say, well, how can I be meek to everyone I see today? Well, let me just take notes and think of all these things that I can say and all these things that I can do in order to be a meek person. That is, that, that, that is living by sight and living by works. And, and if you're doing that, then, then this, is, this is for you to hear today. God desires for you to be meek. He desires for you to learn how to pray and to learn how to study your Bible and to be long-suffering and to develop all the fruit of the Spirit but not by you forcing it into action, but by you letting the Holy Spirit conform you to a greater degree today into the person of Jesus Christ. And how's that done? Well, that, that, that's the question right there, how someone would ask, well, how do you tie, how, how, why, why does the cross have anything to do with me doing and being obedient to a basic command of God? How, how does the cross have anything to do with me uh, 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 taking care of a widow, as the Bible tells us we ought to, or taking care of the poor? The, the poor. What does what does what Christ did at Calvary have anything to do with that? Well, I'll tell you. It's what it's the same way I just said. When I try to feed the poor, and I and I try my hardest to do that instead of. And I put on an act of a good person and try to do this in an imitation, as he was talking about earlier, instead of God letting, instead of me letting God turn me into the person of Christ, which will give to the poor and will take care of the widow, when I try to force it into existence, then I will find myself just totally, I, I have the reins of my life. Now, I'm deciding who I am, and, and you may even be using Scripture to justify it. Well, yeah, I'm doing this, and I'm doing that, and, and don't get me wrong here tonight. I, I'm saying that God desires to turn you in to a person who will do those things and who will be obedient to His Word. I'm not knocking good works. That's what the Bible teaches us. But I'm simply saying tonight, even how to do all those things, that is because we are the new man living unto righteousness. That is because we're letting the Holy Spirit conform us into that person, that perfect person of Christ. 
And that all leads back to the, 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 the new covenant being explained here really in this chapter of, of, of how do I serve righteousness and, and how do I live unto God and, and live unto holiness and, and how do I let the Holy Spirit conform me into the image of Christ? Well, you do it by doing this, a constant moment-by-moment moment, trust and dependence on the fact and the truth that Christ has already provided all that I will ever need for. It doesn't get simpler than that. Right, yeah, it's a moment-by-moment moment thing. Um, you know, um, personally, you know, after knowing the message of the cross now and having experienced the benefits of it, you know, um, Knowing it, I still recognize every single day, you know, every single day I still want to live for him. And it should be the desire of every single Christian's heart. We should still want to live for him. And in the past, some years ago, when I didn't know how to, that's all I'll be striving. Lord, how do I do it? Well, now we've got the knowledge on how to live for him. So my heart's desire still hasn't changed. I still want to live for him. But I also recognize that I can't. But I also recognize that in Christ I can, where I'm dead, and now Christ can live through me. The life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved Him, loved me and gave Himself for me. And by exhibiting faith in who He is and what He's done, now I can live for Him. I not only have a desire that wants to live for Him, I know now know how to live for Him. I know I can't, but I know that in Christ I can, that I can reckon myself indeed dead unto sin and alive unto God. And the reality never changes. And I just want to challenge the watchers because I challenge it myself every day. Do I still want to live for him? Because the reality is, at times, even I've experienced, oh, I, I got these fruits in the spirit last time. I got this blessing from God and this blessing. And then sometimes we get in this place of complacency. And it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian. I know the terminology now. I'm, I'm, I'm all right. No, are you still living for him? Is your heart still surrendered to him? Because that's what it boils down to. Are you from the heart still obeying that sound doctrine? Do you not just know it in your head, know how to live for him, know that you once had a desire to live for him, but right now are you still having that heart's desire to still live for him? Because when you have that heart's desire to still live for him, it, he's going to bring you right back to that same reality of reckoning yourself indeed dead unto sin and alive unto God in Christ. Right. He's done the work, and he's always going to keep bringing us back to that. Right. And um, me personally, I just that, that's just my been my heart's desire recently more than ever. Just am I still just living for him? When the when the you know the the podcast and the little preachings, you know, when it's all said and done, am I just reading my Bible just because I want to know him and hear his voice and and live for him by hearing that righteousness that's written in his word? Or am I looking for a sermon outline or something? Right. Or am I truly seeking this out from my own heart to just live for him when when no one's watching? Am I just it, it, when it's all alone in my room now? Am I still just living for him? Is my heart still just trusting him where I'm right with him just because I believe in what he's done? And that's what it all boils down to. When all the terminology is gone, when all the ministry is gone, when every, all the relationships are gone, am I just simply just trusting in him? Is my heart still just believing unto righteousness? And because if that alone, that's all that matters. That's all God's concerned about. He cares about you individually. He cares about every single one of us individually. And he wants you individually to just keep trusting him. You individually to keep living for him. He's not caring about just you knowing the terminology. Are you personally in your heart living for him and being conformed unto righteousness? And as the Bible says it, slaves of righteousness for holiness. Because mm -hmm. holiness is going to be a result of that. Mm -hmm. But it stems from a, just a heart that no matter what just says, I want to just live for you. And I recognize that it's only done through what you've done on Calvary. And I want to believe it because I want to live for you because I love you. Because you first loved me and I want to love you and exhibit that same love to you. And I recognize from your word that you gave us a blueprint on how to love you. And it's only by found in what you've done on Calvary. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we can't escape that, you know. Um, because uh, me personally, I get caught up in terminology sometimes, reading the word, but the simple truth on how to live for God still remains. And it's this simple. Just trust in what he's done for you on Calvary. Right. He's done it all. And if you are trusting him, you are living for him. Trust in the work that he's done. He's finished the work on Calvary. He's paid for your sins, that you've, every single sin you committed, every addiction, and every problem that you can ever face, he's already paid for it, atoned for it. Are you believing in that place where he did atone for it? Right. Um, every single one of us, we are... Uh, Christ became righteousness, is righteous. Reality is we never knew it. Now we know it, and let's keep on believing it. Let's keep on trusting in it. Yeah, I don't think the, 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 the person who really loves the Lord and wants to live for the Lord, like, like you're describing your own self, and then the Apostle Paul, at the very end of his life, he's, he's 
all that he knew and all that he did literally used by God to, 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 to bring, well, really to write two-thirds of the New Covenant, the, the, the New Testament. But he still is saying that I may know him. Because it, it, it's a truth, a great truth. The more we know him, the more that in and of itself cre creates a desire to know more of him because his knowledge is endless. And you, we've heard it from many preachers when they use the phrase, we're just scratching the surface, the, the surface. And that's true. Who can know God? Who can know God? In, in, in the fullness of who God is. Nobody. Uh, you know, uh, these people that think they have to understand God to, to believe in God. Well, if you could understand everything there was to understand about God, what kind of God would that be? Right. And but, but again, back to the point, Paul, even though you so greatly of God uh, to get us much of what we have today, at the end of his life, he's still saying... I want to know him more. Mm -hmm. And then he, he in that scripture, he, 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 you know, he's writing there. He tells the avenue of that, the fellowship of his sufferings and the, uh, the, the power of his resurrection, being made conformable unto his death. Paul knew that. And the more you focus on that, that Jonathan was saying, and, 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 and see more of the, the light in the scriptures in that only place of life the scriptures offer uh, the more your heart's going to desire to know him more not just for a Sunday school lesson or a, a message to preach but for, for your own personal relationship to grow I mean that's a good 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 word I mean because uh, when the lights are off and nobody there but you and him that's really all that matters not what you just got through doing. The Bible teaches at the end of the day, you're still a servant. Right. You hadn't reached up on no high level of now you got servants under you for all the government of 12 folks who think they need to go out and get 12 to be under them. At the end of the day, the Bible teaches we're still servants. Right. And thank God it's serving uh, obedience. It's under righteousness that free gift we are from the Lord in Christ and have become. And it's we're we're still servants and and we're still children. We're we're children, not not. I'm, we're not saying we're we're just immature and we stay at a place of of milk and never move on to the meat. But we're children with God. We're servants of God. Even when you find the answer of how to please God, you don't stop seeking Him there. Now, you found the answer. You're not looking for another means, but you're seeking that God. And the reality is when you believe from the heart that answer, Christ and Him crucified, you are going to seek Him out. And, you know, there, there, there's a lot of people who have heard the answer, but maybe they weren't seeking. And that's what creates that... that, mm -hmm. that, uh, 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 that Purgatory, if you will, it's not a purgatory that, that the the Catholics teach, but that's what creates that limbo that people get stuck in of of that head knowledge, and they know they know this message, they've heard it a thousand times, but they really can't make the rubber meet the road, and it's because it, are they seeking? Like Jonathan said, when they're alone. Uh, 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 is it still about them and God or is it just about them and God when they're in public at, at a service, at a study at, a, at an outreach is that the only time they're, they're serving? No, you see it's, it's those that fear the Lord, which we talked about means value, that he shows his covenant to Psalm 25, 14 those who fear God and once you have that covenant revealed unto you you, it doesn't mean you've stopped fearing God and you've stopped seeking Him and, and you've made it to a destination now where you can sit down and be content. No, just as he, this is we were all saying, Paul was at the end of his life and uh, in, other, in other books he made comments that said, I've finished the race, I've, I've kept the faith, but he's still saying there's more. Mm -hmm. He was saying, I'm ready to go meet my master Christ, but while I'm here, there's more. 
And we are very much, I believe, at the end of, of this age in today's time. And I believe that the Lord's getting ready to come back and get us. But that doesn't mean that we, we sit and we wait with our arms uh, folded behind us and in crisscross applesauce just waiting and expecting. No, we ought to be waiting and expecting and, and digging and seeking every single day still seeking after God. Right. Um, as, as, uh, real quick, as Pastor Curtis just said, uh, he's talking about knowing him, we have Paul, an apostle, you know, not just any apostle, apostle, and who brought this message of the cross to everyone who knew it like no other, you know, in, in the Bible. Again, I guarantee you, he probably knew it like no other. And we have this this man, Paul, who who's an apostle of the message of the cross, and in Philippians, he comes to this place and he says, as Pastor Curtis just mentioned in verse 10, chapter 3, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering and being conformed to his death. And he continues to... So be, but before that, he says, and be found in him, not help having my own righteousness, which of the law, um, but just being known. And we have, we have, we see Paul here, who had this message, knew this message like no other, and at, in his life, he still, because I guarantee you, he knew this for years already, and he still is writing to the Philippians and saying this that I may know him, and uh, that's just it. Just stood out to me when Pastor Curtis said it. You know, we could know it for how long? I've only known it for a few years now, but. You know, when I get to, I don't know how old Paul was here, but whenever I get to his age, I still want to be in that process, not just knowing the terminology, not just being able to preach to the Philippians and the other people he wrote to, but being an experiential, because it's an experiential knowledge. And I want to be in that same spot where I'm continuing to know him, mm -hmm. continuing to know him. And we can only know him, as Pastor Greg just said, in the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, be conformed unto this death. That's where he's known. That's how we know him. Mm -hmm. When we're experientially knowing him, experientially, um, I don't know better to say it, experiential knowing him, I'll say mm -hmm. it again. When we're experientially know a third time, knowing him, <laughs> we're going to be conformed unto his death. That's where we're known. That's how we're known. That's how we know him, how we experience him. Mm -hmm. We experience him by being by being dead indeed unto sin, by being alive unto God. We experience him by, by the, as it says, the power of his resurrection that raised Christ up, can raise us up to live for God. Mm -hmm. Can not only do that, but we can have fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed unto his death. And the reality is we can still know him. And there's joy in it. There's peace in that. There's the fruit of the Spirit that can be born in us. Um, there's going to be the witness of the Spirit as we live for him. And all the benefits that we see we can experience as we continue just to experientially know him. I don't want to just read about him. I don't want to just get the, the, the right mm -hmm. biblical doctrine right. I want to actually know him. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to continue to actually know him because we can't exhaust it. Um, nope. You know, Paul got to the end of his life, and he, as Andrew just said, fought the good fight of faith. He did well, but he fought it to the very end. He was continually experiencing to the very end. And then after he gave his last breath, he, you know, we, we know he definitely went to heaven. And that's where, you know, um, another challenge, I would just like to just challenge us just to keep believing to the very end, keep wanting to know him to the very end, to our very last breath. Mm -hmm. um, and I know I cut you off. Yeah, I'm trying to remember what I was going to say. Um, oh, sorry. No, you're good. Um, He's young, he'll remember. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I know it's something along the lines I'll probably come to when I probably start talking, but, uh, you know, we're servants of righteousness. And because we're servants of righteousness, I think uh, a lot of times we make emphasis of, of the faith part of it. But a part of that is also, like we're talking about right now, it's seeking his righteousness. Do we want to be righteous? Christ was righteous, and um, you know, just having that knowledge of knowing that uh, by faith we can become righteous, it's good. But no, but that's just half of the equation. The other half includes us genuinely surrendering our hearts and our lives to be righteous. Do we want that? Um, is that like what Jonathan and all of us are saying here? You know, is that really where our heartbeat is at? You know, do we really want to just be like him? At the end of the day, is that what we want? Do we want to put on a show? Do we want any of this, or do we genuinely just want to be like Christ? Do we want his righteousness? Are we really servants of righteousness? And as you're saying, let's seek, you know, in the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, I forget which verse it is, but it says, those who hunger, who would seek, or the hunger and thirst after my righteousness shall be filled. Filled with what? Filled with righteousness. If I hunger and thirst, well, if I hunger for a burger, I'm gonna be filled with that burger. If I hunger for some water, I'm gonna be filled with that water. If I'm hungry and thirsting for righteousness, it's because I want that. I'm hungry and thirsting for it. And then I'm gonna be filled with righteousness. 
And we just got through saying, well, Christ is that righteousness. We can have that righteousness. We can be servants of that righteousness. But, uh, you know, just to give a verse for what Stephen just said, we're here to hunger and seek after, hunger and thirst after righteousness. Seek after righteousness. That's always the goal, because God wants to fill us with righteousness. He's paid the uh, He's paid the price on Calvary so that we can be filled with this righteousness. And when we have a heart for it, it's so that, really, it's birthed from God. God, God gave us that heart to seek it in the first place. And because it's him who draws us all to him. But um, when we hunger and thirst for it, he wants to fill us with it. Right. Yeah, you know, the Lord only justifies what is righteous. He don't justify nothing else. Before he could justify us, he had to declare us righteous. I know it all happened like in this one moment, but there is an order to it. He, I mean, because Romans 5 teaches that righteousness is unto justification. You had to be righteous first, and then God stamped you just. Well, it's the same way with our daily living. That we mentioned first there is the is the positional. It's, it's, it's solid because we're in Christ through faith in the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And he stamped us before we ever even went to church on Sunday or, or even had a Bible. We believed upon Christ and what he did at Calvary, which in his eyes is obeying righteousness. Right. And he stamped you just. But now... The Romans 6 really brings to focus and places the emphasis on what God wants to justify in your daily life, which is your righteous fruit. And that's why it's got to be obedience that's under righteousness. That means it's what the Holy Spirit's doing that's glorifying the one who is our righteousness. Uh, he, he, he justified you because you believed in the right thing. And he only justifies your fruit if your faith is still in the right thing. Mm -hmm. So Romans 6 is about what Calvary's cross provided for us to partake of daily. Jesus taught daily so that, as Jonathan clearly said, as we hunger and thirst for his righteousness, he fills us with that because that's the only thing he's going to justify. That's all he's going to justify. He's not justifying. I mean, he can't justify me going to church or reading my Bible today if it's not unto righteousness. And, and, and it's not under righteousness unless it's through our faith in the obedience of Christ that's unto any and all righteousness. Right. And as, as Jonathan uh, spent some time talking about uh, the all the theology and the terminology and putting everything together we can know it and preach it just as good as anybody can but at the end of the day do we believe it are we surrendered to it are we surrendered to the truth because then that's when it's that experiential knowledge and and you may be watching today and you may be in probably one this could be one of the hardest places to be in where you say well, well, I know the truth, and, and I, I want to want to serve God, if that makes sense. And you're not just saying, I want to serve God. Maybe there's some believers listening who are thinking in their head, well, I want that desire that they're talking about. And how do I get that? And, and I don't have that. What's going on? And my, my answer to you is this. If you're crying out to God to give you the desire to serve Him, you are you have a desire to serve Him. And, and, and this is the reality. This is the truth that the, the message isn't going to change just because you hear Jonathan present it a certain way or you hear me present it a certain way or Stephen or Pastor Curtis present it in a certain way. It, don't be looking and waiting for that moment that, uh, oh, it just clicked and it's everything is good now, I got it. You don't have to wait to hear it a certain way. Believe that which you've already heard. And you may ask, well, well, well I'm trying. I'm doing my best. What does it actually, what does all that actually mean? I know I, I have to put my faith in the cross. I know I have to surrender to that, but what does it actually mean? 
You know what it means. You've heard it. And I believe that the Bible's answer and God's answer <coughs> and my answer to you today is you can't do it. Quit trying to do it and let God do it. And that may be say, well, that's just very oversimplified. I've tried that. Just let him do it. Let him do the work in you because we can't do it. Depend on what he's done. Yeah, you know, sound doctrine, we can have it. Theological sound doctrine, we can know it. But to put one foot forward into it is a whole other thing. Right. I can tell it, I can say it, then I can go home and treat my wife like I shouldn't treat her. Right. Sound theological doctrine, that's, that learning... You, you got to hear it first, but then you got to walk in it to be right. learning it. You can't just be hearing it. But when you truly hear it, that means you're truly walking in it. The Holy Spirit can't guide you into anything. He can't teach you. Mm -hmm. He don't just say, come on, after we get through the end of it, then, then I'll know. You're not going, nobody's going into anything that they're not in agreement with anyway. I'm not going that way. I, I, I can't see that. I'm not. Uh, I don't, you know, but it, it, but it's it's right here for us to read. I, I want to share a scripture. I know we're probably getting close to ending, but it, it fits along with what we're saying tonight. Psalms 37, we've heard it talked about, preached, taught so many times, and I won't get in too deep, but Psalms 37 and 4, right in the middle of it, the Bible says, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Well, as Jonathan brought out, really and truly, our desire should be that our hearts be filled with righteousness. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about that. Mm -hmm. I should, I, as a Christian, I should want in my heart that what which the Lord puts in there and what he wants to fill my heart with is righteousness. So look at this. Delight yourself also in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. The word delight here, it's, it's very profound. It does mean what it, uh, the way we use it, but look at this, the word to delight yourself in the Lord means to have a soft or a pliable heart. A heart. Really, just because I say I delight in the Lord doesn't mean God actually sees that I'm really delighting in Him. To delight in the heart means I have a soft and pliable, changeable heart. And he, and, and, and as Jonathan brought out earlier, it, it's it's something that never stops. It's not okay. I, that, that may be a big problem in Christianity. I got touched by the Lord. That'll hold me for five years. No, it won't hold you till 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 tomorrow. And uh, uh, we 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 need a touch from the Lord every day, but we need a touch of truth and righteousness in our hearts. So to delight ourselves in the Lord, that allows Him to give us the desires in our heart. Uh, of, of our heart is to is to mean that our heart is pliable and it's soft and it's changeable. He 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 should have the right to change me because if I can't be changed, my delight really is not in him except in verbal form. And 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 for for a person to learn Romans chapter six, I mean, when did the Lord bring the truth, the illumination of Romans chapter six? Uh, to Paul, to Brother Swaggart, to me, to, to anybody who's actually grabbed a hold of it, or rather it grabbed a hold of them because they were in a desperate place, but not just in a desperate place. Everybody's in a desperate place, but a place of desperation and desiring to live for God. Please, God. What pleases God? The Bible surely can tell me. And, and and that's when Paul received the revelation of the message of the cross, and I'll call it illumination for us. Uh, that's when the light came on. I remember my own experience standing there just not sure and, and confused, and, and, and I began to hear that message from, from Brother Swaggart and, and the folks in Baton Rouge, and my hope came alive again. My, my desire to be in ministry began to come alive again. I, I had almost thrown the towel in completely on everything. But when I begin to hear the message of the cross, which really is the message of how to live for God, then everything began to happen inside of me. The, the, the inner man that had become 
dormant and shut down began to find that lively hope again and, and, and everything started moving forward in the things of God growing and, and having uh, hope and, and the comfort of the Lord and and, and just and, and there's no end to, to learning once you really see what's written in Romans chapter 6 there's no such thing as, as, as getting tired of it Right. None. And that, that's not just something good we say because we're right. teaching. That's a reality because that's what the Holy Spirit's going to bring you back to, at least the truths written there every time you're having trouble. Right. It's not just something that we say. It's the light that lights our life. Yeah. So if it goes out, what do we do? If, the, if we let the truth burn out, if we let... The, the, the this truth burn out in our, our hearts then 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 we that that is that's when it just becomes a, a, a darkness and confusion and all these things and really the goal as we've all said in some way tonight the goal of of, of this living for God is not just uh, salvation from from the penalty of sin or even salvation from the power of sin. The, the goal ultimately is to know Christ and to be like Christ. And everything else, follow everything in the Bible, all those things, salvation, victory over sin, knowing Christ, everything in the entire Word of God is all under the umbrella of Christ and what He did at Calvary. That is where it. That's where it's accessible. That's where it's available. That's where we're planted. That's what we participate in. Not just watch the cross from afar, but we participate in what happened there when we believe in Christ that He is the Redeemer and He provided everything we need. What What is What is according to the Word of God? What is the one avenue that God said, if you seek this before everything else? I'll add everything you need to your life. Righteousness. Is that Matthew 6, 33? Mm -hmm. he, he, because his son is the righteous one. The work he did is the righteous work. And that's who we seek. That's what we seek. And if that is what we're seeking before everything else, then everything that God promises us in the word, he will add to our lives. Mm -hmm. Right? He'll make it all a reality. It is already a reality, but he'll make it a reality in our hearts to us. Right, and as we close, just one last, one last verse, you know, like, um, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. You know, just to go along with what you guys are saying, we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, all these things is going to be added unto us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's all. And his Amen. kingdom is not meat and drink, but righteousness. Righteousness. That's just Joy as you see it. The Holy Ghost. That's what we see. His kingdom and his righteousness. Who yeah, he is yeah I think there's an emphasis there because his kingdom is righteousness. So I think in that scripture there, uh, Romans 14, 17, the emphasis is on seek his kingdom and his righteousness. Because mm -hmm. we got our own, mm -hmm. but it ain't no good. <laughs> right. It's rotten yeah. and filthy. Right. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, we want to thank you for tuning in to episode seven. It's been a blessing to have you. Thanks added. for having me. We uh, we're honored to have you as our honored first, to be here. first guest, and uh, we're I think we're all pretty thankful for. Uh, I know I am the impact your ministry has had on my life now for almost twenty two years. Praise the Lord. And I believe I'm thankful, and and maybe I'm partial and biased, but I believe <laughs> that the Lord is using him in a way. Uh, to bring about new truths to this message of the cross Amen. and not something you know that's just that's just only for him or only for me or only for us but the Lord uses people Amen. to bring about certain things that God really wants us to start thinking on and I believe and I hope and we pray that that's what we're being used to do in your lives and I want to thank you for tuning in this weekend and be sure to tune in in the morning at 10 a.m. Uh, it'll be on the Pastor Curtis Facebook page, streaming live. I'll be press it, uh, preaching a message called, What Do You Have to Offer? out of Joshua chapter 4. And I hope you can tune in. Thank you for tuning in for another episode. And God bless you and have a good weekend.